Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Miller from Ohio EPA. We will be starting our presentation in approximately one minute as we still do have some folks logging on. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Ohio EPA's Water Pollution Control Loan Program, or the WPCLF, Program Year 2024. My name is Helen Miller with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance here at Ohio EPA, and I will be moderating this afternoon's presentation with Ohio EPA's John Bernstein, Katie Courtright, and Steve Malone. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate and engage with our presenters. On this slide, you see an example screenshot of your attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop on the right-hand side of your screen. For this presentation, you're listening in using your computer audio. If you are having sound issues or if the slides stop advancing, try refreshing your browser. If that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. Please feel free to submit questions to the presenters by clicking on the question mark icon and typing them into the questions pane on your attendee interface. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll try our best to answer questions as they come in and during the Q&A portion. If we do not answer your question during the Q&A portion, we will reach out to you via email following today's webinar. You can also click on the document icon to view the included handouts. Handouts today include a PDF file of the PowerPoint slides used for today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording and a follow-up email along with the survey. The survey will also appear once this webinar ends. We value your feedback and would greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we're doing and let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. A link to download your certificate of attendance will also be emailed to you after the session. With that, I'm going to turn it over to John Bernstein. Great, thank you, Helen. And thank you everybody for joining us today for our program year 2024 WPCLF webinar. And we appreciate your patience as well. We know we're a little bit behind this year, but uh, we've been working behind the scenes and we're really looking forward to calendar year for program year 2024. With me. So today uh, I'm going to get us kicked off with our welcome introductions and give you a brief overview about the WPCLF program. I will then turn it over to Katie Courtright, our assistant chief in DEFA, uh, to give you some highlights and updates for program year 2024. She's also going to cover some changes we're looking at for program year 2025, and she'll cover principal forgiveness. Steve Malone, the manager of our technical re review section, will then cover readiness to proceed and go over some nomination information in our program management plan schedule. And please feel free to chat in your questions anytime. I think we'll have ample time to answer your questions at the end. So to kick us off, we're gonna do a quick poll. We'd just like to see who's out there. So please let us know, has your community or your client community previously received funding through the WPCLF? Please check yes or no. And I have launched the poll. So if you can make your selection when it pops up on your screen, we would appreciate it. And it looks like most people have voted. If you have not, go ahead and please make your final selection. And I'm going to close the poll. 
and share the results. There you, there you go, John. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Helen, and thanks for participating. Um, not surprising that most of you have participated. Um, you know, we've we've had a long um, long history of the WPCLF and have reached a lot of customers in Ohio. And those of you who are new to the program, welcome, and we hope to give you some good information today. Okay, so what exactly does DFA, Office Financial Assistance, do? You know, primarily we are the program administrators of the state revolving fund programs for the state of Ohio. Every state has SRF programs, and the uh, um, uh, as well as Puerto Rico, and we've all got a clean water state revolving fund program for wastewater, and a drinking water state revolving fund program for um, for drinking water. And in Ohio, the clean water program we're talking about today is the Water Pollution Control Loan Fund. We do not handle um, the financial transactions. That's actually all accomplished by our partners with the Ohio Water Development Authority or OWDA. We like to refer to them as our banker for the SRF programs. Additionally, we do help to administer the wastewater treatment plant uh, compliance um, assistance program. We've got some dedicated staff that will come out to your typically small wastewater treatment plants to give you some hands-on assistance and really get you geared up with process control um, fixes to get your treatment plan running again. So if you're ever interested in having our staff come out uh, for that program, we'd be happy to send them out to you. So the WPCLF has been around for, for quite a long time, since 1989. And like its sister program, the Water Supply Revolving Loan Account for Drinking Water, this one was created by the Clean Water Act, and the Drinking Water Program was created by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, we've been awarding loans for over 30 years, and um, probably to the tune of about $13 billion so far through the WPCLF. Every loan that we issue goes out with subsidy. That's a requirement of the Clean Water Act. Um, our standard rate for any borrower is 1.25% below market. And I think if you do the math, you know, if you're borrowing a million dollars over the length of that loan, you'll save probably about $130,000. So good savings across the board. Um, very popular, but small portion of our WPCLF program is principal forgiveness. That is the portion of our capitalization grant from US EPA that we offer to communities um, as essentially grant. It's a loan that doesn't need to be repaid. Hence, we call it principal forgiveness. And um, the loans we offer are planning, design, and construction. So really, we're here for the life cycle of your project. We're happy to get you started to select the best alternative. We're happy to get that project designed and happy to get it constructed with you. Oftentimes, what our borrowers do is kind of roll these loans. So you may take your planning loan out, roll that into design, and eventually roll that into construction. So if you're taking a loan out, you may not even need to repay anything until your project is in the ground. I don't have it on this slide, but just worth mentioning to you all, um, you know, we are keeping a close eye on federal earmarks. Uh, this is something Congress has been doing for a couple of years now, and it does have an impact on state revolving fund programs across the country. Uh, it's less money coming in, that's less money going out to our communities, and uh, it does have an impact on the capacity of our program. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're ever interested to hear more about earmarks, we'd be happy to talk to you. So what type of projects can we fund? This is not um, inclusive, but Something you'll hear a lot about from us today is regionalization. This is a, um, a concept that's really gained a lot of ground in Ohio, and we have seen work at both a very small scale and a very large scale. Uh, it's something we've incentivized with both loan discounts as well as principal forgiveness for a number of years now, and we're gonna put a little more emphasis behind that in the coming years. Um, unlike the drinking water state fund program, we do have to work with public borrowers. Um, it, it's very challenging for us, and uh, there are some complications with the Clean Water Act with us working with private borrowers. So our primary audience is publicly owned treatment works. And you know, typical projects we're working on is uh, kind of your, your bread and butter rehab, you know, maybe of your collection system, perhaps some improvements um, of your treatment plant, some, some uh, equipment that's out of date or has uh, approached its useful life, uh, and some more niche things like water efficiency, energy efficiency and resiliency. Um, you know, that's something we can incentivize and I think it's gonna be more important, you know, in the years to come as energy becomes uh, more expensive and perhaps, you know, we're, we're having some other issues where these become important. Popular program at the local level has been our household sewage treatment system, principal forgiveness program. Uh, since about 2016, we've been offering grants to our local health districts to assist homeowners at the uh, house level basis. To repair and place failing septic systems. We've, we've I think, repaired over 5,000 systems, and it's a really, really uh, great program that we're happy to support. And stormwater, 
uh, kind of a newer feature. I, I say that even though it's not as new now, but since 2015, changes to the Clean Water Act have allowed us to um, really have a more um, more generous look at stormwater projects. So if you have a stormwater utility, we can probably work with you to fund those stormwater projects. And this is uh, just looking back last year to 2022. Um, we've already blown this this um, 2022 record year out of the water in 2023. So I think in 2022, uh, you can see there through, uh, through the WPCLF, over $750 million awarded. $11 million for the HSTS program I just mentioned, 21 projects awarded through our Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program, which Steve Malone would be uh, happy to talk to you about if you'd love to explore that program, and uh, $38 million in principal forgiveness awarded. Kind of worth noting that, uh, you know, this is kind of the first year bill, so I, I think looking at 2023 numbers, you will see more principal forgiveness had gone out the door through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, and speaking of that, the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL, you know, these are the additional funds made available to the state revolving, state revolving fund programs, and these numbers are specific to Ohio. So looking ahead to uh, program year 2024, we're receiving a supplemental grant of $117 million for the WPCLF and $12 million for emerging contaminants. This is addition to our, our base capitalization grant, which should be about $42 million. So uh, a lot of money. The the clean water money there on, on the uh, screen, that's all going out as principal forgiveness. And you know we, we definitely wanna take a hard look at uh, projects specifically uh, for PFAS through the clean, on the clean water side. And the left column, the base program, 50% of that money is going out the door as principal forgiveness. So definitely more, more money going out the door as grant than a normal year. Okay, so regionalization. 85% um, of you have are, are here and have been back, so you're you're probably not surprised by our focus on regionalization. It's something since I believe 2015 we've been offering 0% funding for, and we've had dedicated principal forgiveness uh, for those types of projects. And we're looking at both large and small communities, but if this is the most cost-effective alternative, that's going to be our preferred approach for either a new wastewater treatment plant, a plant expansion, could be a major wastewater treatment plant renovation you're looking at or extensions to unsewered areas. So we're, we're gonna really be taking a hard look, uh, especially in program year 2025 at those types of projects. Uh, why do it? People ask the question, why do you want us to, to regionalize? Like I said, we've, we've seen a track record in Ohio. Um, this can really work well at the watershed basis. Um, it, it, it really helps with collaboration and resiliency. Um, you're gonna hear more about that with climate change and other factors uh, kind of impacting the state and certainly eliminate, eliminates du duplicative services. Uh, something we have a close eye on is workforce. Um, you know, workforce is getting harder and harder to come by, especially in the wastewater world. So just being able to retain and attract, you know, the, those highly skilled, perhaps they're a class three, class four wastewater treatment plant operator, regionalization can help with that. Okay, so we are going to take another quick poll and I'm gonna hand the reins over to Katie Courtright. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Courtright. I'm the Assistant Chief here in DIVA's Office of Financial Assistance. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we get into my portion, we're just going to take another quick poll. And this is just asking, uh, what is your affiliation? It's always good to know who's in the audience and uh, who they represent. So your options are um, A through E. You can choose all that apply, local government official, wastewater utility representative, consultant, technical assistance provider, or other. We can launch the poll. Okay, I have launched the poll, so go ahead and make your selections. And it looks like most people have voted. If you have not, please make your uh, selection before I close the poll. Mm -hmm. 
And I am closing the poll and sharing the results. There you go, Katie. Thanks, Helen. Okay, and a good representation from, from multiple organizations with us today, and thank you for that. Um, it's always good to see a, a good representative spread from, from the folks that we work with most. Okay. For my portion of today's presentation, um, as John mentioned earlier, I'm gonna focus on highlights and updates for program year 2024. Um, I will also um, review our eligibility criteria for principal forgiveness. So let's start with some highlights for program year 24 and uh, we'll start with discounted rates and that's on the left-hand side there. So discounted interest rates, if you participated in our program before, some of these will be very familiar to you. Um, Regionalization, um, as John mentioned, is a, is a high priority for the agency and for our program. We're gonna continue to offer 0% interest financing for regionalization projects. And that includes any regionalization project that nominates. So whether your project is eligible for principal forgiveness or not, regionalization is eligible for 0%. Um, another is our water resource restoration sponsorship program discount. If your loan sponsors one of these projects, you can receive up to a 0.1% interest rate reduction. Um, and a couple of our standard, um, in addition to what you see here, our standard interest rate, as well as our 1% and 0% hardship rates will also apply in 2024. For the next bullet, the water reuse discount. So this is new. Water reuse discount, we're developing a new discount in 2024, and, and we'll see how it goes going forward. But these are for projects that um, will have a water reuse component to them. An example there is effluent reuse project. So we'll be working on some guidance that will be available and detailing it out in the program management plan uh, for 24 for our water reuse projects. Um, if you are working on something uh, related to this, if this is a concept you're thinking about, we would welcome the opportunity to meet with you and talk through your project um, and what you know, we have in mind for this discount. So look for more on that. Um, and then also I wanted to make note um, in terms of the nutrient reduction discount, we anticipate sunsetting this discount in 2025. So it'll be available here in 2024, um, and we're anticipating sunsetting that 2025. If you have a project um, that's already under planning and design, you're working on it, if you anticipated this discount, please reach out to us so that we can go through with you um, what your financing package would look like for that, for that project. But just a heads up on that one. In addition to um, the discounted rates here, as John mentioned, planning and design loans are always at 0%. So planning and design um, for any project is always offered at 0% as well. Okay, on the other side of this um, slide is principal forgiveness. For program year 2024, it's up to $70 million. And that's a significant increase and that's due to the additional funding we're receiving through the bipartisan infrastructure law or bill. Um, the top two there are important. Uh, regionalization, as John had mentioned, and you're going to hear that a lot today in this presentation, regionalization is our um, preferred alternative for projects, but it's also our priority for the program. So obviously we're going to put some regionalization principal forgiveness. Um, I'm going to skip that next one. We'll come back to it, uh, regionalization evaluation. But as in previous years, small disadvantaged community projects, large disadvantaged community projects, the HSTS program and the backup power generator purchase. These are all items that we'll be looking at for principal forgiveness in 2024. For the uh, DSW, which is Division of Surface Water, regionalization evaluation, we're going to walk through this in a little bit more detail here in an upcoming slide, but this will be a one-time principal forgiveness offering for design projects. So if you um, have a design project coming through, um, this would be an opportunity for you to receive a little bit of principal forgiveness to do some additional planning effort uh, for the regionalization alternative, so in the regionalization evaluation. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail coming up. Okay. Some more highlights for program year 24 about emerging contaminants. 
Uh, so you saw from the previous slides on bill funding, we are receiving some additional dollars that are um, directed towards emerging contaminants. And in wastewater, that, that means a couple things, but uh, it's unregulated contaminants. So these things are unregulated. Some examples are what you might uh, have heard of most is PFAS, um, but also as well as like microplastics and pharmaceuticals. It does not cover nutrients, um, emerging contaminants, because there are set limits for those. So for program year 24, we have $11.9 million uh, for emerging contaminants. That's all principal forgiveness. Um, that could go towards a planning, design, or construction project. And there's some examples of um, what you could potentially do with a planning project um, that we've heard from some systems um, already this year, um, potentially sampling uh, some of the effluent from industrial discharge um, to identify if there's some additional treatment options or construction work that needs to be done there as well as purchase of sampling equipment for a wastewater treatment facility. We have one project that um, received some funding for that um, in our current program year. So emerging contaminants, $11.9 million for principal forgiveness. Okay. And I continue with updates for program year 2024. Um, Sunsetting discounts on the left-hand side there. So we have three discounts listed. We've had these discounts in the program management plan for a number of years. They're very rarely used, if at all. Um, so these, these discounts will be sunset here in 2024. And as we've mentioned, um, they're on the right-hand side, enhanced focus on regionalization. Um, we are working with our division of surface water to develop a regionalization evaluation guidance um, that will be available here soon in September, uh, towards the end of September 2023. Uh, this will be a new planning guidance uh, for regionalization. If you're familiar with the drinking water program and, and some of the um, processes there, this would be similar to like a general plan. Uh, it's sort of that precursor planning work um, before you go through design. This is this is going to be directed toward new, new wastewater treatment plants, plant expansions, major improvements, and extensions to unsewered areas. And it will be a preferred evaluation for 2024 and then required in 2025 going forward. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple slides. Okay. So update a planning review for 2024. This, the new Division of Surface Water DSW regionalization evaluation is encouraged for these specific project types. It is preferred that planning and design projects follow the new criteria, and then it'll be required here in program year 2025 to assist communities with this effort. Um, for those communities that have already had planning complete and you're ready for design, we're offering a one-time Principal Forgiveness Award up to $50,000 per project to conduct this evaluation. Um, and you'll notice on the nomination form, which is available in your handout section, there's a new option for check in the box there for uh, Principal Forgiveness for Regionalization Evaluation. And Steve's going to go through a couple of things on the nomination form as well. There's more to come on this. Obviously, the um, guidance document, as I mentioned, we're anticipating towards the end of September. And then we're also planning a webinar um, in October 2023 to walk through the regionalization evaluation guidance and um, how this works with these project types. OK, on principal forgiveness. On the previous slides, we, we saw $70 million this year for principal forgiveness. Um, to qualify for principal forgiveness for those like regionalization, small community, large community, principal forgiveness, we use socioeconomic benchmarks to identify those communities that are eligible. Um, each community must meet three out of four of the um, criteria identified here. We're evaluated against the state average benchmarks. Um, we use the 2021 American Community Survey information from the Census Bureau uh, for the state benchmarks as well as all the community benchmarks. In your handout section of the webinar and also available online, 
are the lists of communities that are eligible for principal forgiveness. There's one for small communities, so that's less than 10,000 population, and then one for large communities and counties. And those are available, and your handouts are online. So guidelines for principal forgiveness, very similar to last year. Um, if you uh, went through the program, then it's a maximum of $4 million per project. There is a restriction to one award per entity per program year. So one award per entity per program year. So if you have a regionalization project and you're a large community with other projects eligible for principal forgiveness, uh, you'll only receive one award um, for the program year. What we're looking for for principal forgiveness are high scoring projects, obviously from disadvantaged communities, and those will be evaluated for readiness to proceed. Project score, readiness, and our agency priorities will be used to rank the projects eligible for principal forgiveness funding, and we'll use all the funding until it runs out. Um, Steve, I think, is up next, and he is going to provide you some additional information on readiness to proceed as well as the nomination process. Steve, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, everyone, who's joined us today for uh, this latest update on the Water Pollution Control Loan Fund. I think we're going to start off here with a quick poll, it looks like. And in this case, we're going to be asking about submitting nominations. And what we're particularly interested in is whether you plan to submit a nomination for some of the emerging contaminants funding that both John and Katie were talking about earlier. So choices are fairly simple, yes, no, or undecided. Okay, I have launched the poll. So go ahead and make your selection when it pops up. And it looks like most people have made their selection. If you haven't, please go ahead and make that selection before I close the poll. Okay, I'm sharing the results. Back to you, Steve. Thank you, Helen. Well, it looks like a few of you are interested in proceeding with nominations for emerging contaminants. And while that looks like a small percent, uh, it's a larger one than we first started uh, looking at this last year, so that's encouraging. And hopefully uh, some of you among the undecideds will uh, nominate projects to move forward uh, with this type of funding as well. So thank you. And I'm not seeing. There, we, whoops, there we go, getting ahead of ourselves. So, we just talked about principal forgiveness and how one might be eligible for that and some of the limitations on it. Katie noted that there are several things that are involved. Basically, one has to be eligible to start with. And we have those handouts and that information. And while we're not really talking in any detail about it, scoring is very, very important when it comes to principal forgiveness. Primarily, the projects that have high scores related to human health issues, sewage being found in areas with failing household sewage treatment systems, sewage backing up into basements, other types of projects where sewage and human contact are more likely, those are the types of projects 
that are going to score uh, highest in our system for scoring and ranking projects. So while readiness to proceed is important, please be aware that the way our system is set up, if you're eligible and you score highly in these categories, then the next step to see if you're going to be one of those communities that is fortunate enough to qualify and receive principal forgiveness will be to establish if you are indeed ready to go forward with your project. And here you see the general criteria that we have been using for a number of years to try to help best determine which projects are more ready to proceed than others. And the basic items you see listed here include the user charge system, for which a point is, is given, approvable planning information, worth another point, design that's underway, then worth a point, permit to install applications, the design has proceeded far enough to submit for a PTI, that's worth a point. And if you have in fact submitted and received an approved permit to install, that's actually worth two points, uh, one for the application and the second for the approval. Because you are about as ready to proceed as you can be, at least from a design standpoint, if you have a PTI. And finally, public participation, uh, also worth another point. Now to drill down a little bit more in terms of what this means for you and your project. When we look at some of these different issues, there are things that are more important than others. Generally, an established user charge system, which is very important because that's how we determine project's ability to repay a loan and to operate a system, is not an issue that affects most projects because most of you already have established user charge systems. However, if a community is looking to put in a centralized system and doesn't have one currently, then this is something new. And it will be important not just to establish one, but to show that you are ready to proceed because you already have a system on the books, you pass legislation perhaps to establish one, and even more importantly, that you may have begun collecting at least a nominal fee in advance of the system so that you won't have as much of a burden financially going forward, and you've shown how serious you are about proceeding with this new centralized system. For planning information, and Katie was talking about some of the, the new uh, planning requirements that are being put forward by our Division of Surface Water, the planning information that we have traditionally asked for also encompasses much of what is being looked for when it comes to regionalization. We encourage people to provide as complete information as possible about the planning that you have done to establish the need for your project, the different alternatives that might be available, including regionalization, to accomplish what's needed, the costs involved, uh, public involvement, hopefully that has been conducted, any environmental impacts or social impacts, concerns that need to be addressed, uh, schedules for the project, any and all information that relates to the planning of your project is something that's important to us. So we encourage that in whatever form you have it, preliminary engineering reports, general plans, facilities plans, whatever they're called, please provide what you have uh, because that will help us again to see just how much has been done or not done to get your project ready to go. Now getting to the design and PTI portion, for the basic initial design underway, and getting a point for that, we want to see at least the design contract has been executed and hopefully a summary of how much design work has been completed at the time that you submit the nomination. Same with a PTI application, we're looking for a documentation that, that has been submitted when that occurred and the PTI approval when that occurred as well. Those are important dates to establish that you qualify for those points, that you have in fact reached those milestones and have moved far down the road of being ready to go to construction. And then lastly, public participation, like the established user charge system, first bullet point, is something that often is not terribly important to the success of your project. Your 
making some upgrades to your wastewater plant, if you're rehabbing some of your sewers, if you're doing a lot of other work to help improve your system, that's great, but it's probably not going to have a big effect on the local citizens and therefore isn't going to involve a lot of public involvement. However, again, if you're doing something, like putting in a central system where none exists, or you're increasing rates very significantly because you're putting in a new system or you're making some very, very expensive improvements, then it is going to be important to document that you have provided information to the public and you have public support. We have had projects that have lacked that and have gone way down the road only to find out that that lack of public support uh, was going to do the project in and prevent it from going forward. So we do look to see, particularly in those cases that I mentioned, that you have done your outreach, done your homework, have informed the public and hopefully gotten positive responses to show that this project can go forward and will not be stopped because something like this was not done in a timely fashion. Now, moving on to that nomination process. Being here in September, all of you who are familiar with our program realize that we're a bit behind because by this time we would be reviewing nominations, August 1st to August 31st being our typical nomination period. This year, the call for nominations having been delayed until August 25th, we are accepting nominations for that full 30-day period of time, and that is September 25th. That as again in the past, includes all new project nominations, as well as what we call to or refer to as renominations. And those would be projects that we are currently working with you on, but for whatever reason may be delayed beyond the end of this program year, December 2023. You aren't required to renominate, but we always encourage people who have not gotten funding at this point, it's very much in your best interest to renominate just in case expected delays or something else comes along and then your project will be on the 2024 project list and we can continue to work with you and, and hopefully resolve the issues and get it funded. So we're looking for all those nominations during this period of time. Uh, you see the the female uh, address to submit those nominations, one per project with an automatic response going out per applicant, uh, which has been the typical process. We note here, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, that we have a new instructional, hopefully improved process for receiving large file submissions. Uh, and as I said, we have a little bit more information about that. We are using for our nomination form, which has been slightly modified and updated to include all the things that John and Katie have talked about. So just to note, if you already submitted a nomination before this using the old form, I think we're still okay, but please, if you haven't, look to the new form that's out there. It includes all the information we would normally be looking for, a cover page, a checklist, borrower information, contacts, project schedule, all those things uh, are on there with the additions noted. There are instructions provided to help address questions you might have along the way. And I think, I hope that we have done a good job of assisting you with that. But if not, or if you still have questions, please reach out to any of us uh, to try to help answer those rather than get frustrated trying to work through something and, and not fully understand what it is that we might be looking for. The of note on the nomination form, the schedules that you provide are really keyed around when you want your loan award. That date then is used to populate all the various milestone dates that come before it. Things like PTI submittals and approvals, if that hasn't occurred already. Uh, application submittals, environmental review timelines, all of the different 
things that need to be accomplished programmatically are tuned to that award date. So make sure to look at that on the form that provides a project schedule so that you will also have an idea of timelines for some of the things we need and what the likely schedule is going to ultimately look like for your project. It may be that you're a bit ambitious in when that loan award will occur, and this will help show you the amount of time that may be necessary that perhaps you hadn't anticipated when you put uh, that schedule together. Katie also noted that uh, this various discounts are available. Those are identified on uh, the, one of the sheets that we have within the nomination form. These are, again, hopefully mostly self-explanatory, but uh, again, if you have questions, please reach out and we'll try to answer those for you. Katie also noted the Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program sponsorship option that is one of the available discounts for a community that is able to provide that. And what I mean by is able to, uh, sponsorship of a WRRSP project requires a loan that generates a certain amount of interest, enough to cover the cost of the WRRSP project. So those tend to be larger dollar amount projects, loan projects that can sponsor WRSP projects. It doesn't have to be a huge project. We've had smaller communities that have successfully sponsored them, just like some of our larger borrowers. We encourage people to look at this. Uh, it's always helpful to reduce what you have to borrow, and it helps us to fund these important water quality, wetland and stream restoration and protection projects. So please consider that and ask us again if you have questions. One final note on this, people sometimes ask us, how can I get on the list for H2 Ohio funding, perhaps for additional US EPA grants? Uh, for several of these types of funding sources and for other funders you may be seeking who perhaps will partner with us in helping fund your project, a good first step is to nominate your project to our WPCLF or WSRLA nomination uh, through our process so that you can be put on our list and as part of that potentially be considered for something like H2 Ohio funding or other grants. It's not a guarantee but it is a very good first step in identifying who you are, what your interest is, and how we might be able to help you. And all of this that we've been talking about results in our annual program management plan. This plan includes various programmatic elements that make up the Water Pollution Control Loan Fund. It describes some of these highlights and priorities that we've been covering. It identifies where our funding comes from, et cetera, et cetera. And very importantly, it lists all the projects that are nominated, that are put on the list including those that qualify for principal forgiveness and, and other discounts. We put this together after we have received all the nominations, have scored them, have ranked them for principal forgiveness, have considered readiness to proceed and other factors. Based on all of that, we prepare a draft list that indicates what we think will be our projects going forward, and that goes out for a 30-day public comment period. Again, if you're familiar with the program, this has typically occurred in late October. This draft list goes out. We're expecting, again, to be about a month behind, so we're looking uh, probably closer to Thanksgiving-ish uh, for that draft list to be put together so that hopefully by late November, early December, that will be out. When it does, please look through it, look for your projects, make sure what you nominated is there, see what it qualified for, if it qualified for some of the things you're interested in, and ask questions, particularly if you don't see something or you see something that you're pretty sure is not accurate. We do our best. We have a fine group of people who spend a lot of time on this, but things happen. When you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these nominations as we do, we may miss something 
we may not get something quite right. So please look over that draft list and let us know what you find. Once that period of time is over for public comment and our public hearing, that will conclude the public comment period. We will finalize the list, make any changes based on your input, your questions, anything else we need to. And our intention, as always, is to have this list finalized and ready to go for loan awards beginning in January. And loans, in fact, being made uh, at the end of January, the first available time in 2024. So I think that takes us through most of what we wanted to cover today. Again, our contact information is here for you. If you need to reach out, you have questions, uh, comments, you need assistance with something, we're always happy to try to help. And Ellen, I guess it's back to you now to let us know what, what questions we may have. Great. Well, thank you so much, John, Katie, and Steve. And we are going to begin answering the questions that have come in. We have some great questions coming in. Um, please continue to go ahead and put those into the Q&A pane. Uh, and we will take a look at those. Uh, before we start going through those, I'd like to remind you that there are a bunch of different handouts, if you look at the document icon, that you can download. Uh, one of those is the PowerPoint for this presentation, but there are also others there as well. So you can take some time and download those while we go through the questions. So the first question is, is there an amount of funding dedicated to principal forgiveness for large disadvantaged communities? And what are the criteria to qualify in this category? John, would you like to take that one? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. So historically, since we've been offering principal forgiveness, last year was the first year we actually opened the door to larger communities, over 10,000 population for principal forgiveness. And, you know, I do anticipate that we'll have buckets um, of certain category types. We've, we've been doing that for a long time. And I think it's an equitable way to um, kind of spread the principal forgiveness to different project types. I do not have an amount. Uh, for any category that's something we'll be looking at as we develop the draft program management plan um, but helen just mentioned the handouts um, two of the handouts we have are large community principal forgiveness eligibility and small community principal forgiveness eligibility and you know that that determination is based on um, some statewide benchmarks for median household income for unemployment rate and for poverty level so those two handouts are are to the side there where helen mentioned for large communities and small communities Okay, and Katie, here's a question for you. If a project falls under regionalization, would the community still need to show they meet average income levels? Thanks, Alan. Yeah, so for regionalization projects, there's really two types of funding, you know, incentives that we offer. Um, there's a regionalization discount, which is the 0% funding, and that's eligible, that's available to any entity that's doing a regionalization project to receive principal forgiveness for a regionalization project that's where you need to show um, that you meet the disadvantaged community criteria so depending on where your community is you know and how large they are if it's a small community under 10,000, take a look at that small community list to see if your community is listed or um, the large community and counties list if you're if it's over 10,000. So for principal forgiveness, yes, they need me to they need to meet the criteria for the discount. No, that's open to everyone. Thanks, Alan. Yes. Um, so John, here is one for you. If a project has been awarded money from House Bill 168 and an earmark is pending, does that affect the project negatively or positively from receiving um, PF for principal forgiveness? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, House Bill 168, House Bill 45, and House Bill 33 um, from the state of Ohio, those were all for Ohio Department of Development's Water and Sewer Infrastructure Grant Program. And we are happy to co-fund projects with any funder, including development. Um, so, so no impact there. Um, I do have a word of caution on earmarks. Um, earmarks tend to take a long time to work through the process with US EPA. Um, so we, we do want to see projects awarded for principal forgiveness within the program year. So that's just something, you know, a word of caution is timing with earmarks. It's, it's not going to impact you positively or negatively. 
you know, if you score well and, and meet the criteria, um, that's how you're, you're going to be in line for PF. It's just timing is a, an issue with your marks. Okay, and Steve, here is one for you. If our project does not require a PTI, do we automatically get those two readiness to proceed points or do we lose out on those points? Well, that's a question that is comes up not infrequently because we do have some projects that fall into that category. Uh, we're not going to automatically disqualify or provide them. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the status of that project just as though it were one that was required to get a PTI. Uh, and instead of saying, have you received a PTI, we're going to be looking at, have you completed design? And how do you document that you've completed design? Because that's what we are looking for ultimately, whether you get a PTI or not. So whether it's a stormwater project or perhaps a replacement in kind of a sewer line uh, that's old and, and needs work, we're going to look to see how ready is that to proceed. And in this case, we would be looking at have you completed design and therefore are you ready to go to bid in construction? Okay, uh, Katie, here's one for you. We have a renomination. Do we have to include all the same documents from the original submission of nomination or just submit the renomination form? It's a good question. So it depends on if there's been any updates or changes to your project. So if um, there are no changes and, and no updates to the project status to be provided, it, it would just be the nomination form. But if there's any information um, that you think would be helpful to your project in terms of scoring or um, readiness to proceed evaluation or any of that, um, please do submit it along with the nomination um, form as backup materials. Okay, and Steve, here is one for you. Does the nutrient reduction discount have to be identified in the nomination? I don't believe, Helen, that we have required it to be identified in order for it to apply. Uh, it's helpful uh, for us to know that uh, because there are certain things that we'll be looking for in order for a project to document that it does meet the qualifications. And knowing that going forward will help our review team, our engineers, our planners to take a look at those factors and to ask the relevant questions but I don't think we have ever required that it has to be identified initially on the nomination in order to ultimately get money for nutrient discount. Okay, Katie, here's another one for you. Will the principal forgiveness loan timelines awards coincide with the OWDA monthly board meetings? And if so, will the OWDA board hold meetings on the last Thursdays of most months as was done in 2023? Yeah, good question. So all of our loans do follow the OWDA board uh, meeting schedule. And those are always the last Thursdays of the month. Uh, there is no meeting in November. So keep that in mind when you're doing your scheduling. But um, they will follow the OWDA board meeting schedule on the last Thursdays of the month. For projects with principal forgiveness, they do follow our same internal schedule, review schedule as all the other loans um, leading up to that um, approval at the end of the month. So everything is on that same schedule and time frame. So the in the nomination form, when you fill out your anticipated award date and that schedule fills in in the back, you can use that. Um, to help sort of guide your your schedule and your and your planning processes to get that project approved. Okay, uh, John, here is one for you. If a nomination is for a sewer extension to replace failing septic systems, but is part of a defined facility planning area, may it be categorized as regionalization, or is that designation? restricted to sewer extensions to areas not currently contained within a POTW's facility planning area? That's a great question. And I, I believe we would categorize that as regionalization. Um, you know, I would err on the side of caution. If you think it's a regionalization project, you know, check that box or give us a call. Um, it's something where we're really interested in supporting, um, you know, our borrowers and planners in. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about regionalization, that's, that's either consolidation or extensions, you know, to pick up a concentrated area. 
um, but maybe failing septic systems. So feel free to reach out if you want to talk in more detail about that project. Okay, and John, here's another one for you. Does the regionalization evaluation just apply to WPCLF funded projects? Yeah, another another good question. Um, the, the evaluation we're talking about for the WPCLF is specific to the WPCLF uh, for our funded projects. Um, you know, our, our division of surface water already has these planning requirements for projects we don't fund. And if you look at the WSRLA, we already have kind of analogous requirements of the general planning process. So we're, we're kind of looking at similar things through these, these planning processes, but um, to answer your question, you know, you're, you're going to be going through similar evaluations, whether uh, through WPCLF or through another program. Okay, we'll uh, wrap up here with a couple more questions. Here's another question. If my community receives a WPCLF loan, does that mean I can't accept any other funding sources like grants? John, do you want to take that one? I'm sorry, Helen, I missed that one. Oh, okay. Uh, if my community receives a WPCLF loan, does that mean I can't accept any other funding sources like grants? Oh, um, absolutely not. So like I mentioned in a previous um, question, we're happy to be a co-funder with any project. So uh, if you've been fortunate enough to receive other grants or you're looking for us to be the last mile, uh, we're certainly happy to help you out with your project. Okay, and Katie, uh, here's one for you. Can a community receive more than one WPCLF Principal Forgiveness Award in a program year? Yep, good question. Um, the short answer is no. The Principal Forgiveness Awards are one award per entity per year. The exceptions to that are for backup power. You can receive uh, Principal Forgiveness uh, through the regular principal forgiveness uh, project options, as well as that $50,000 principal forgiveness for like backup power. So that's the exception. Um, but otherwise, uh, no, it's just one per entity per year. Well, the other exception, Katie, might be if you're fortunate enough to qualify on the drinking water side for principal forgiveness, um, then your community might receive principal forgiveness in a given year from a couple different sources. Yep, excellent point, Steve. Thank you. Okay, and this will be our final wrap-up question. Is there, uh, Katie, uh, you could go ahead and take this one too. Is there a match requirement for WPCLF funding? It's a good question. Um, unlike some funding sources uh, that communities might be uh, familiar with, uh, the WPCLF does not require a matching source. Um, as John mentioned, we can co-fund with multiple funding sources. So, you know, the WPCF can fund a portion of the project and there'll be other funding sources that take care of the rest. What we are looking for at the end of the day before we award a loan is that the total project cost is accounted for. So whether you want to borrow all that through WPCLF or provide other funding, even local funding uh, for portions of that, that's fine. Uh, but there's no match requirement. Uh, you can structure that however it makes the best sense for your project. And if I could add on again to, to what Katie was just saying there, we don't require it, but we can provide a match through our loan program if you need one for earmarks or some other source of funding that requires a match. Uh, you could conceivably get that by using some of our loan funds to provide the match. Okay, a lot of great questions. So thank you, John, Katie, and Steve for your great presentations. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you leave, you will receive a survey. We value your feedback and we would greatly appreciate it if you let us know how, you, how we're doing and let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. A link to download your certificate of attendance will also be emailed to you. And before we end for today, please join us for some more upcoming trainings. On September 19th through the 21st, we have our virtual sustainability conference. Registration's open. This free virtual conference will showcase sustainability efforts and perspectives representing all sizes of businesses, communities, 
academic institutions, and sustainably focused organizations. During the conference, attendees will hear from Ohio sustainability leaders who are eager to share their insight on how they've gone above and beyond to encourage, implement, and highlight sustainable practices in their organizations. Then on October 2nd, we have our Recycling and Litter Prevention Grant kickoff. This webinar will discuss Ohio EPA's 2024 Recycling and Litter Prevention Grant application process, funding opportunities, and eligible project activities targeted by this grant program. And then on October 12th, we have our NPDES permitting new and proposed rules and policies. So you can learn about new and proposed rules, policies that are in process, and upcoming regulations that could impact your non-stormwater NPDES permit. So to register for these upcoming webinars, you can go to our agency event calendar at the link on the slide. The events link is also on our web page footer at the bottom of every web page. If you miss past webinars, you can go to DFA's web page at the link on the slide. Once you're on our web page, if you click on the word training on the left hand menu column, you'll find recordings of trainings you may have missed. You can also go to our agency YouTube channel to view recorded webinars. And we'll post a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel. It usually posts within a week of the webinar, and we'll also post a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides with the recording. And the YouTube channel link can be found at the bottom of each web page on the footer, and it's right next to the Twitter icon. To receive notifications for upcoming webinars, you can go to our Ohio EPA resource hub. You can create an account, then go to the option subscribe to updates, then select, select the uh, option all trainings, webinars, and conferences at the link on the slide. And the resource hub is also at the bottom footer on every web page. With that, we'll end today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.